you would stand for the rest of the sermon. And uh, no, I'm, just <laughs> I'm just kidding. You can be seated. That might cure the going to sleep during the sermon part, though. If you can stand while or sleep while standing up through the sermon, you have my permission to sleep during the sermon, okay? Because you're tired if that's the case. I would invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Hosea. That's where we're going to start this morning. I appreciate you being here. I hope that you will be back tonight. We are this evening going to continue our series of lessons we're doing once a month uh, on You Asked For It. And tonight's lesson is of particular interest because um, it's one that probably if you've ever tried to discuss spiritual things with someone in, in your family, in the community, you've probably been asked a question about our topic for tonight. Because our topic tonight is baptism. And what's the big deal about baptism? You know, sometimes we make too big a deal about it because sometimes we tend to look at baptism like it's, it's the, the only thing that matters. And we're accused of that sometimes. What, y'all think all you have to do is just be dunked in water and you're good. And sometimes we do overemphasize it. That's in part because of the way that pendulum swings, and, and there's so many people that, that undervalue baptism. There are a lot of people in the religious world, on the other hand, though, that, that don't see the need in emphasizing baptism, don't realize what it is and what it does. And so we just ask that you would be here tonight if you've ever had any question, and several of you did have questions about baptism when we filled out those cards back in November. Uh, if you have questions about baptism, we're going to try to look at what the Bible says, not what our tradition holds or what I think or, or your preacher's opinion about anything. We're going to look at what the Bible says about baptism because you asked for it. So we hope that you'll be here this evening as we discuss that. We're going to start this morning in the book of Hosea, and then we're going to jump over to the book of Ephesians. Now, Hosea is not a book that we turn to often. When you open up your Bible right in the middle, you're probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, the uh, uh, Psalms, Proverbs area. If you'll keep going to the right, you'll go through the books of history. You'll go through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations and the, the major prophets. And after you get through those, we have the last 13 books of the Old Testament are what we call the minor prophets. Now, they're minor not because of their message. They're not minor prophets because of their importance. We simply call them the minor prophets because... They're smaller than the major prophets. The major prophets are bigger books than the minor prophets are. They tend to be smaller books. And Hosea is the first of these 13 small books that wind up the Old Testament during a time in which the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew nation, is divided already. There's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And they are getting to the threshold of the time that they're going to be carried off into captivity. And God is sending prophets through the time before, during, and after to tell the people, sometimes it's his people, sometimes it's Gentile nations that they are prophesying to. But the, the point of the prophet's message is always that you need to repent and turn back to God. Uh, that's the only way that there is hope. And he does it in a variety of ways. Sometimes he will um, look at a particular um, illustration, he'll do something in the life of a prophet to make it illustrate the point that he's trying to make. That's what we see with Hosea. Hosea starts off like most of the minor prophets do by saying a word of the Lord came to Hosea. And that's the way that most of the prophets begin. Is they're, they're, We see either it's said that way or we see actually the Lord beginning to talk to the prophet and, and tell him. So a little minor point that we can get out of, of the minor prophets and maybe someday that would be a good uh, series of lessons for us to go through, uh, maybe in the next year or two, is to just go through all of the minor prophets and because we probably don't spend enough time in them as we should. A lot of good lessons there. One of the good lessons from the prophets is the things that they're teaching, it's not their opinion, it's not what they think, it's the word of the Lord that they're, pro that they're proclaiming to the people. And that's what really matters. And so the word of the Lord comes to Hosea. That's not unusual. Something is told for Hosea to do. Uh, the first three chapters of this book actually is, is an incident or a series of incidents that occur in the life of Hosea. Then beginning in chapter 4 to the end of the book is his actual sermon that he preaches based on the illustration that he begins with in these first three chapters. Um, and, and, and something of that effect is not really unusual. A lot of times God would tell the prophets to do something that, again, was 
was illustrating or emphasizing the point that he's trying to make to them. What is interesting is you look there in Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, what's, what's unusual, um, maybe even shocking, is what it is that God tells Hosea to do. He tells him in the first three verses here, I want you to go out and I want you to marry a woman of harlotry. Now you got to admit, that's an unusual thing for God to tell his man to do, isn't it? That, that's not the kind of woman that we would expect him to say, you need to go take a woman of harlotry, a, a prostitute, as your wife, see? Now there's nothing sinful per se about him marrying a prostitute or a harlot. It would have been had he been one of the priests, of course. But for Hosea, it wasn't a sin for him to do that. We might look at it and say, had God not told him to, it probably was not a, a real good idea to marry. That's not the kind of woman, young men, that's not the kind of woman that you want to marry unless God directly tells you, and he's probably not going to do that, okay? That's not the, the first choice of a man of God. If you're going to get married to someone, marry a woman of harlotry. And then, he says, take children to you of harlotry. In other words, they're going to be children that are not yours, that are, are because of all of the, the men that she's gone off with, and you're going to raise them. But Hosea, being a good and a godly man, even as ridiculous to us as this particular command might seem, Hosea does exactly what God says. He goes out and he finds this woman named Gomer. Now, when we're thinking Gomer, probably the first thing that we think of is Gomer Pyle, right? You know, yes, sir, Sergeant Carter. But Gomer is a female. It's a woman. There's another Gomer in the Bible that's a male. In fact, when we were thinking of gene names for our boys, when we got to number three, Gomer was one of my suggestions. I tried to tell Melody he's a mighty warrior in the Bible, and she said, well, He's a, a silly guy on a television show for most people these days. So we, Gannon's not Gomer now, thanks to your mama. So. But Gomer here is used as a female name. It's a woman of harlotry. And that's who he takes for his wife. And they have a child of their own. And then she has other children in chapters 1 and, and uh, chapter 2. He talks about them a little bit more. That... It's not put in the same way. The first child, it says that Gomer, or that Hosea knew Gomer, and they had a child. And then it says that there are other children born, so we have to assume they're not Hosea's. But he takes them into his home. And they're given names. God tells you, this is the name that you're going to give them. And all these names have a meaning that represents the relationship that God has with his people, the children of Israel. And, and as we continue to read, what we understand is that this illustration, God is, is showing that, that Gomer is the children of Israel. And Hosea, in the illustration, represents God the Father. And he's telling them that, you know, I took you. You weren't perfect when I took you. Remember, they no more got out of the land of Egypt. And what were they saying? Boy, they had cucumbers back in Egypt. I wish I was back there. Really, cucumbers is what it takes? But God did anyway, right? He, he, on Mount Sinai, he gives the law to Moses. And Moses comes down and tells the people, this is God's offer. You be his people and he'll be your God. And, and, and God stuck his hand down and they reached up and grabbed his hand and and they, they accepted that relationship, and the blood was shed. We talked about last week. You weren't perfect when I took you as my bride. Neither was Gomer perfect when Hosea took her as his bride. And then what Gomer does is what you would expect for a harlot to do. She acts like a harlot. And she leaves Hosea. And she leaves her children. And she leaves and abandons her responsibilities in her home and her family. Just like the children of Israel had done to God. And so when we get to chapter 3, if you flip on over to chapter 3, when we get to chapter 3, after all of this has transpired, Gomer and Hosea have been married. Now Gomer has left him and, 
and she's gone into a life of harlotry. And as was often the case with, with women who would be in that sort of lifestyle, she finds herself in a position where now she's up on the slave block. And she's being sold at auction as a slave. And here she is standing up very much like our positioning now. There would have been a group of people and up on a, a, a rise of some sort, a, a block or, or some staging area that they would have constructed. At the top of a staircase, they would have brought out the slaves so everyone could have seen. And Gomer standing up here in front of everyone and the bidding begins. Now imagine for a minute that you're Hosea and that wife that you took as your own, who you had a child with, you accepted her children, you treated her like a queen and you loved her and she abandoned you and left you for someone else. Multiple. And now here she is on the slate. What would you say to her? I'll tell you what I would say to her. I would say, well, you made your bed, now you can sleep in it. Wouldn't you? I guess you're going to get what's coming to you now. Isn't that what you'd say? Isn't it? Be honest. Yeah. I would say that, that, that you're going to get what you deserve. I would say that, 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 you know, I'm glad this is happening to you. But maybe what's even more shocking in chapter, than what happens in chapter 1 is found in chapter 3. Because God tells Hosea, you go down there and you buy her back. You buy her back. And that's what he does. And he ends up paying what Exodus would tell us is, is the price of a wounded slave. You can imagine that would have been the physical condition that she would have been in. He pray, pay, pays for her the price of a wounded slave and he brings her back into their home and he says from now on, you're going to be my wife. Now I'm going to love you and I'm going to take care of you, but you're going to be faithful to me. And we're going to have the right kind of relationship that we should, see. Now turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. We've been talking about the last couple of weeks this idea of, of jargon. The idea that there's, there's words that we use in whatever field that we're in that that are, are very particular to our field. They're words that, that maybe people that are not in our area of expertise wouldn't understand. Maybe they're words that, that we've adapted a different meaning to because of the particular field that we're in. And sometimes we do that with Bible words. We have big words that we use in church settings that we then try to talk about with people outside the church without really explaining what those words mean. And sometimes it's because we don't really have a good grasp of what they mean. We sometimes just think that, well, the, the synonym of being saved or something of that effect. And it all, all of these words have to do with our salvation. But all of them are words that are very particular in their definition that shows us something about our salvation that paints a very beautiful picture of our relationship with God. And our word for this week is redemption. Paul, as I mentioned a few weeks ago when Wesley Walker was here, Paul was very legalistic in the way that he approached his uh, handling of the idea of sin. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was a member of the council. And so uh, very legal terminology would be something that he would be very comfortable with in the way that his mind would probably work. And so when you think about him describing redemption as part of our salvation, that scene that you see with Hosea and Gomer are very much on the forefront of his thoughts, of seeing someone who's been taken in slavery, who's standing before on an auction block, who's offering themselves for sale, who's a slave, who's been taken captive sometimes. Sometimes it was someone that because of the desperation of their situation would sell themselves to slavery because they saw no other way out. But you have someone who, who is under the control of someone or something else. And now at the slave box, there's someone that has the, the opportunity and takes advantage of it to pay for someone's freedom, to buy them back. That's the idea 
behind redemption. So what I want us to do, if you're following your outline in your bulletin today, Hosea and Gomer is the story we talked about for point one. We're going to look at, at four things. I'm trying to make this as confusing as I can. There's five points, but we're going to look at four things, points two through five, uh, about our redemption that we see here in the book of Ephesians. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter one, and of course we, we kind of... Uh, preached through the book of Ephesians last year, and so hopefully it's still kind of fresh on your mind, and you're very familiar with what's going on here at the beginning of Ephesians. In chapter 1, after a short uh, salutation, he gets right into the matter and starts with this great doxology, this great praise that he gives, and he begins by praising God the Father, then he praises God the Son, then he praises God the Spirit, and after he talks about what each of these three parts of the Godhead has done in regards to our salvation, he ends all three segments by saying, to the praise of his glory. And and that's what he's trying to get them to do, is praise God on behalf of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Praise God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit on behalf of what each individual part of the Godhead has done in regards to our salvation, that we would not be where we are were it not for them. And so as we look into that context, notice what he says here in verse 4 of chapter 1, and verse uh, 7, rather, of chapter 1 in the book of Ephesians. And the first idea that we want to notice is is that redemption is to pay freedom's price. That's what he says here in verse 7, that redemption is to pay freedom's price. In whom, and in context of verse 7, he's talking about Jesus, in whom, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to his grace, he said. We have redemption. Jesus has bought us back. God has bought us back through Jesus. In him, in the beloved. That's who he's talking about. You notice verse 3 and verse 4. He's talking about the beloved. He's talking about Jesus. All of this in him or in Christ or in Jesus terminology that you see uh, throughout this particular set of uh, verses here. In Jesus is where we have that redemption. God is buying us back. He is redeeming us. We are slaves to sin. And it doesn't matter what particular situation that you might have faced, sin always puts us in slavery, doesn't it? Sometimes it's a slavery that's really easily seen. Maybe it's something, some sort of addiction that has control of our life. Maybe you've been addicted to alcohol. Some in here have been addicted to drugs. Some in this room have been addicted to power and to money. Some in here, if the, if the stats hold out in our congregation as they do in the church as a whole, of the men, and we're counting men as, as, as guys 13 and above, 55% of men in the church have, view pornography at least once a week. There, there's all kinds of addictions that we can have, see? And, and we, we sometimes don't realize what a grasp, what a clutch that those things have in, on our lives until we try to stop them. And then we start hearing those voices that it's time to go gamble again, that it's time to have a drink again, that it's time to go to that website again, see? But even in those things that maybe aren't addictive forms of our sin. They still have a hold of us, don't they? How many times have you, you said something that you, you later look back and say, I wish I didn't say that to my wife? How many times have you gossiped about someone and, and then later on said, I wish I really hadn't said that? How many times have you, you, you maybe uh, not been kind to someone in a, a situation where you should have been kind to a brother or sister and you let those opportunities pass you by? See, sin has has a hold on our lives. And certainly when you think about our eternal direction, it does. What he's saying here in verse 7 is that we can have forgiveness of those sins. Where is it at? In Jesus, see. He's going to redeem us because of his grace, he says. And that's the only reason that we can have it. Verse 6, he says, it's been poured out his grace has in the beloved. It's been given to us as a gift. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. Hosea looked up there at Gomer, and there was nothing about her situation where he said, yeah, I really owe it to her to buy her back. That that was never there. And God doesn't look at us and say, yeah, I really owe it to him to buy him back. That's not there. But he does it anyway because of his grace. So the first thing we notice 
is that redemption is to pay freedom's price, to buy us back out of slavery, the price to set us free from Satan. The second thing we notice there in verse 7 is what that actual price is. Because secondly, we notice point three on your outline, that redemption costs the blood of Christ. That's what he says in verse 7. We have redemption through his blood. That was the price that he paid for our sins. It's the blood of Jesus that sets us free. Remember last week we talked about the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood, remember? And the first point that we talked about was redemption. And I told you we are going to talk more about it this week. Well, now we are. It's only the blood that can buy us back. That's the only price that could buy back our freedom. That's the only price that could restore that relationship with God. That's the only price that would set us free from our slavery to sin, only in Jesus. We're in bondage in sin unless we have access to His blood. And the only way we have access to His blood is in Him. That's why in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, when Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders about the importance of their responsibility to the church, he says, which He, Jesus, purchased with His own blood. That was the price that Jesus paid to buy the church, to buy us collectively back to Him. Not only did it buy us back collectively, but individually it did. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, he says, Don't you know that you were bought with a price? You were bought with a price. The blood of Jesus was what bought you individually. He says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit because you're not your own. You've been bought with a price, and that means there's a certain way you need to live, he goes on to say. But we've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We've been redeemed. The third thing we notice, if you look on down in chapter 1 into verses 13 and 14, point four on your outline is that redemption is, uh, redemption's down payment, rather, is the Holy Spirit. Redemption's down payment is the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, You notice he's talking about the Holy Spirit of promise. And then in verse 14 about that Holy Spirit, he says that the Holy Spirit is a pledge or a guarantee or an earnest, depending on what translation that you're using. The word actually means a down payment of our inheritance, it says, looking toward the redemption of the possession. God says, I'm going to show you how serious I am about this. I'm going to give you a down payment. I'm going to give you a pledge. I'm going to give you some earnest money. First house that we bought, we, we went and looked at it. Uh, at, when, when Melody and I first were about to get married, we went and looked at the house. We liked it. We wanted to buy it. Told the guy we did. We got to go to the bank and get the loan. And he said, all right, if you'll give me, I forget what the percentage was, earnest money. Have you ever paid earnest money toward a house? What does that mean? It means I'm not... I'm not taking possession of the house, but I I want everybody to know, really and truly, that's my house right now. And and to show you how serious I am about it, I'm going to pay you this earnest money. When I was a kid growing up, I think they've started back doing it the last couple years, you can go to Walmart and put things on layaway. You ever done that before? You know, you, you get all that, now we just use the credit cards, but back before everybody had credit cards, we had layaway, where you'd go to Walmart and you You'd find all the stuff that you want to get, and you bring it to the back, and you'd say, now, you keep this back here. Don't sell it to anybody else. You hold on to it for me because there's going to come a time that I'm going to come back and take it home with me. Just I'm not taking it with me now, but you consider it mine for right now, okay? And, and the, the clerk would say, you know, you got to pay so much down, right? you got to give a down payment, uh, something that shows how serious... Something that lets us know we shouldn't sell this to somebody else because you're going to come back and get it. What is it that you're going to give Walmart, that down payment, that shows I'm going to come back and pick this up one day, see? That's what he's saying about the Holy Spirit, that that was God's proof that I'm coming back to get them, that they're mine, see? They've been bought by me. That's why he talks about in in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, He talks about that hope does not disappoint because he says the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We're not going to be disappointed in our hope of heaven 
because we can we can count for sure that God's gonna He's gonna bring us He's gonna take us home. He's gonna buy us back because He's given us that down payment. See, in 2 Corinthians 1 22, He says, Who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee or a pledge or a down payment. And there's so many other passages that he talks about that as well. God's saying, I'm serious about the fact, Satan, they no longer belong to you, they belong to me. They're mine. I put them on layaway. Now, I haven't brought them home with me yet. I haven't brought Jason Smith home. I haven't brought Lana Currents home, but they're mine. See, I put a down payment on them and give them the Holy Spirit. But there is going to come a day, if you jump over to chapter 4, there is going to come a day, and it's the last point of our lesson today, that God will pick us up from layaway on the day of redemption. And that's what he talks about in chapter 4 and verse 30. You remember in chapter 4 is that great uh, series of, of verses where he's talking about, he begins it all by saying we're not supposed to walk like the Gentiles walk. There ought to be something different about our walk. So he goes through all of these verses where he says don't do this, instead do this. Don't live like this. Instead, live like this. And verse 30 of chapter 4 is kind of a summary of all of that when he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, you grieve the Holy Spirit by the way that you live your life. See, I can put something on layaway at Walmart, but that does not mean I'm going to come back and get I might change my mind, right? Now, God's not going to change His mind about us, but we can make Him change His mind about us, can't we? By not living in line with His Spirit. By not living in line with what God's Word says that we should do. By not conducting ourselves in the way that He would have us to conduct ourselves. It's not irreversible if we do grieve the Holy Spirit through our lifestyle, but God will not uh, live with people who defy them in, in their lifestyle. In Romans 8 and verse 23, he says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We're looking forward to that day in which God's going to pick us up from layaway. That's the day that, that Jesus is going to come back and say, I put them on layaway, I put down my earnest money, I, I said they were mine and they're mine, and now I'm going to bring them home with me. See, that's the day of redemption that we're looking forward to. So, now what does all that mean to me? All right, so Jesus redeems us, in him too we have redemption. The price that he pays is his blood. The Holy Spirit is what he gives as his down payment to say, I'm serious about this, and they're mine, and I'm coming back to get them. The day of redemption is when he's going to come back and take us out of that way and bring us home with him. But what does all that mean to me? Well, think back to a different Gomer, that Gomer that you probably thought of when I first said Gomer. There's an episode of the Andy Griffith Show. Daniel, you have to excuse another Andy Griffith reference. But there, there's an episode of Andy Griffith Show where Gomer's there at Wally's filling station. He's back in the back on the cot taking a nap. There's a big fire in the barrel. You remember that scene? Andy runs in, puts the fire out. And as he does, Gomer wakes up and he says, well, you just saved my life. I, I, everything that I, I can do, I'm going to do for you. So he catches fish and brings to him and, and, and he's chopping wood for him and, and he's watching out for open. He's, doing, he's making a pest of himself because he's Gomer. But even Gomer Powell, a, a, as, as silly as he was, understood that the only reason I have a life to live is because of this one who saved my life. And even Gomer Powell understood that means that whatever life I now have to live, I owe it to him. Imagine if you're Gomer, the wife of Hosea, and you're looking out at all those beady-eyed, evil people at that auction, and you're thinking, boy, I sure hope I don't have to go home with him. And I sure hope I don't have to go home with him. And I sure hope I don't have to go home with him. And then the one man that's there that truly loves you pays the price and says, I'm going to take you home, and I'm going to love you for the rest of our lives. Are you going to gripe 
because he didn't park the camel in the right place that night? Because he left his sandals out? On, well, no, of course not. You're going to love him, and you're going to be devoted to him, and you're going to be dedicated to him the rest of your life. And God says, you're Gomer, and I'm Gomer. And we are the ones that chose to put ourselves on the auction block and say, Satan, take us home. And God sent Jesus to buy us back. So, this morning, if you've not been redeemed, the only way you can be redeemed is by the blood of Jesus. And the only way you can have that blood of Jesus is by being in Christ. That's what he says in Ephesians 1. And the only way that we can get in Christ is Romans chapter 6 and Galatians chapter 3 because we believe or we have faith that, that Jesus is the Son of God. He's God the Son. And we want to live a life dedicated to Him instead of self. So we confess Him as Lord before others. We're immersed in water. We're baptized into Christ where that blood is that washes away our sins, that buys us back. If you've not been redeemed this morning, we're going to sing a song to encourage you to come forward and let us study with you, let us pray with you, let us help you. Maybe, maybe you're ready to make that confession and be baptized. We'd love to do that. But if you are redeemed, if you have been bought by the blood of Jesus, if you are married as spouse to Christ, are you living that way? Do you have the sense that Gomer Powell does to know that from now on, my life's got to be lived dedicated to the one who redeemed me. If we can help you in that way, we want to as well. Are you subject to the great Redeemer's invitation? Come right now while we stand and while we sing.